Attorney General Sessions, appreciate your willingness to appear before the committee today. Um, I did not remember that. I have no idea. I, I don't recall it. I just don't remember it, but I still do not recall it. I don't have any recollection. I don't know how that occurred. Well, I'd have to rack my brain, but I don't recall it now. I don't recall any such meeting. I don't recall it. I don't know. I don't recall that. Just on the first page of your three pages of written testimony, you wrote, nor do I recall, do not have recollection, do not remember it. So my question is, for any of your testimony today, did you refresh your memory with any written documents? I've said before that I am a firm believer in the power of stupidity and the power of denial. That is to say, stupidity is usually a more than sufficient explanation for the seeming complexity of a clusterfuck. And denial is sometimes so overpowering it's like watching a Mitch McConnell retreat into its shell, an interior world of comforting lies and rationalizations. But I have to admit that as the Russiagate scandal bounces along, the ability of Trumpists to deny, deflect, and obfuscate their situation is reaching levels that still somehow manage to be surprising to this thinking ape. To give you some context to judge it by, I have to reach into the archives for a man named Warren Jeffs, leader and so-called prophet of a splinter sect of Mormonism known as the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or FLDS if you can't chew that mouthful. His movement had all the hallmarks of a typical cult, a single charismatic figure at the center of the organization, informationally and geographically isolated followers, brainwashing, abuse, and the inability of members to criticize the prophet, or the prophet himself to receive the faintest whiff of criticism. Jeffs reportedly had 70 wives and regularly abused the children on his compound. The latter fact led to his downfall. Word eventually got out to the authorities about Jeffs. He found himself on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, but it barely made a dent in his following. He was arrested and convicted by a jury, and still they clung to him, or the idea of him, despite all the evidence. Then, after some quality time in the slammer, Jeffs was taped saying the following to his brother. I am not the prophet. I never was the prophet. And I have been deceived by the powers of evil. Did you hear that? I am not the prophet. I never was the prophet from his own mouth. Brothers and sisters, this is the paradox of the human mind that gives me the most trouble in these troubled times. Because, you see, not even when the fraud admitted he was a fraud did his followers desert him. They stayed on the compound, saying God knows what to each other, coming up with God knows what excuses, justifications, and rationalizations in order to keep believing. They were so invested in this abusive, sick man that even when he admitted he had been lying and abusing them the entire time, they still rushed to his defense, and I suspect their own psychological defense. Because if any of them allowed themselves to see the horror, perhaps they would feel implicated in it themselves. Sometimes it's easier to avoid the mirror than look in it. This week, the Russiagate scandal took on several new contours. Jeff Sessions was questioned under oath and assured the world that, well, he couldn't recall much of anything. But at any rate, he has no knowledge of any collusion with the Russians. He may even be telling a half-truth there, but oddly, he was determined to not answer several of the most important questions posed to him, citing an imaginary privilege he himself was forced to invent on the spot when the president opted not to claim the otherwise legal executive privilege Sessions might have used. He just refused to answer. A bad look when you're trying to clear yourself and your boss of wrongdoing. On the home front... Donald Trump floated the idea through several surrogates, including his lapdog Sean Hannity, that perhaps firing special prosecutor Robert Mueller was in the cards, a notion that harkens back to the 11th hour of Watergate, the only scandal by which we seem able to compare our present circumstance. Having already fired Director Comey under the ludicrous pretense that he was too mean to Hillary Clinton, an excuse Trump himself promptly detonated when he confessed the real reason to Lester Holt on CNN, and finding himself still surrounded by slavish allies and surrogates still willing to self-immolate, he figured, what the hell, why not one step further? And finally, the real Trump card. As I was preparing this commentary, the Washington Post reported that Donald Trump is personally under investigation for, wait for it, obstruction of justice. This is what you might call a gateway crime, a door that once opened can lead to a host of other illegalities. And since multiple members of Team Trump, we learned, are also under investigation for financial crimes, it's hard to imagine a scenario where the investigation stops with mere obstruction. And, of course, all of this is happening under the cloud of a scandal big enough all on its own. 
Our intelligence services have confirmed that Russia meddled in the election and were slowly uncovering that it was worse than originally thought and may have included intrusions into voter databases. The scandal is that Trump and his campaign, acting with full knowledge of Russian interference, were sprinting to lift sanctions on Russia even before Trump was sworn in. A staggering display of disloyalty that all by itself should turn off any rational observer from supporting Comrade Trump. But it doesn't. And that's my point here today. Because the members of Trump's cult, if Twitter is any indication, are having a bit of trouble these days. It seems no matter what is uncovered, no matter how many times Trump and his deflections are carpet bombed by facts, there remains a core base of support so deep in denial that I have little recourse except to compare it to the original Kool-Aid drinkers and cults like them. I have a creeping suspicion that even if Trump is impeached, arrested, and imprisoned for high crimes, there will still be a segment of the country braying about fake news and leakers because, you know, Deep Throat was the real problem, not Nixon. The Trump voter situation is even worse than it appears, too, because the New York Times long ago uncovered a tape, which is almost as damning as Warren Jeff's midnight confession. I wasn't able to dig up the audio, but it's out there. While being interviewed by Pulitzer Prize winner Michael D'Antonio, Trump was asked to contemplate the meaning of his life. His response tells you everything, Trump voter. Everything you ever needed to know. It's right here in plain sight. No, I don't want to think about it, Trump replied. I don't like to analyze myself, because I might not like what I see. I am not the prophet. I never was the prophet. And I have been deceived by the powers of evil. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. I'm a whiner and I keep whining and whining until I win. Maybe somebody will rise up. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. Welcome to Swing State, an aggressive, progressive, critical, and political podcast from the middle of the Midwest. Welcome back to Swing State. I'm Elaine. I'm AJ. And I'm not sure what has me more excited, the fact that there's a new Wolfenstein game coming out, or that the all- right neo-nazis are pissed off about a video game where you get to kill nazis look guys if you hile like a nazi and do step like a nazi you're probably a nazi and people are going to enjoy vicariously destroying you like you're destroying our country while we're on the subject of fascism trump had his first cabinet meeting and it went a little something like this this is our first cabinet meeting with the entire cabinet president Maybe start with Mike, and we'll just go around and just you name your position, and then we'll ask these folks to uh, go back and have a good day, and we're going to discuss our various reports. Mike? Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, just the greatest privilege of my life is to serve as, uh, as Vice President for the President. He's keeping his word to the American people. It's an honor to be and it's able to serve you in that regard. You set the exact right message. You're right, Jeff. Thank you very much. Alex? Mr. President, um, I am uh, privileged to be here, uh, deeply honored, and I want to thank you. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for the kind words about the budget. Thank you, so I appreciate your support and your direction. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, it's a joy to be working with people that uh, I have inherited. Mr. President, it's a privilege to serve. Thank you. President, uh, what an incredible honor it is. To, uh, I can't thank you enough for the privilege that you've given me and leadership that you've shown. Thank you. It's an honor to be your steward of Mr. President. Thank you for the honor to serve of the country. It's a great privilege you've given me. Mr. President, thank you for the uh, opportunity to serve. On behalf of the entire senior staff around you, Mr. President, we thank you for the opportunity and the blessing that you've given us to serve your agenda. Mr. President, it's been a great honor to, uh, to work with you. I want to congratulate you on the men and women you've placed around this table, but this is a team you've assembled that's working hand in glove with, for, for the betterment of America. And I want, to, I want to thank you for that. These are, are great team members, and uh, we're on your team. Thank you, sir. What the fuck was that? All hail our glorious leader? What is this, fucking North Korea? <laughs> starting to look a little that way. You got it. You got to give Trump credit. I mean, at least in this era of politics, there's never a dull moment. Like every day you, you wake up and you think, oh, I've seen it all. I've heard it all. And then you look at Twitter. 
Yeah, there are some longtime political lackey types, you know, who've been covering politics since, you know, Kennedy was in short pants. And they've never seen anything like that. I've certainly never seen anything like that. And the reporting that I'm hearing is that Trump made it known that his cabinet was to do this in advance. One of the things about the Trump presidency is, as horrific as it may be, you can't help but find some of it entertaining. I mean, the ridiculously insane shit that he just throws out there on Twitter fucking daily. But what I initially thought was a joke and then realized is actually a serious effort, uh, Mike Quigley, a representative from Illinois, has introduced the COFEFE Act. And that stands for Communications Over Various Feeds Electronically for Engagement. And it is an attempt to legally identify Twitter, or rather tweets, as part of the presidential record, which means that Trump can't delete them. They become official record. Now, my guess is, actually, I can't guess as to how well that's going to fly, whether it's actually going to happen. Although I think that he has a legitimate argument, and I think it's reasonable, particularly since this seems to be Trump's primary method of communication. I, I think it's reasonable for you to consider this part of the presidential record. I love the fact that they found an acronym that fit that ridiculous cafe fay tweet. Yeah, that actually took some work. You probably had to, you know, get one of your paid interns to sit down, you know, with like a Scrabble board or something and figure that one out for a while. Now, again, I'm sure this is probably going to face an uphill battle, given the Republicans' continued surprising and sort of mystifying support of Trump. But I think it's an interesting effort, and I think it's not entirely unreasonable. And frankly, if your president's going to be a joke you may as well have fun with that. It's the only thing we're going to be able to get out of this is a few laughs. Actually, even though I just made the comment about the uphill battle with regard to the Cafe Fay Act, one of the things I did find sort of interesting with regard to how the Republicans are handling the president is this piece I found in The Hill that, uh, to quote their opening paragraph, the Senate has clinched a wide-ranging bipartisan agreement to slap new financial penalties on Russia and limit President Trump's ability to lift sanctions without giving Congress a chance to weigh in. They can't say that they think he's involved with Russia, apparently, but they can certainly act like it. Why else would you impose something like that? You're literally saying that the Senate needs to circumvent the commander-in-chief to prevent him from engaging in a certain kind of foreign policy decision. Because we know from reporting that the first thing Trump and his little gang wanted to do once they got into office was immediately lift sanctions on Russia. That's already been, that's already an open reporting. Why? Why Russia? Why is this your priority? Why this country of all countries? Why this particular issue of all issues? It's the only issue of anything except for your fucking wall that you seem to have a vested interest in. What's sort of interesting is There are other senators that have pushed a bill, and this is within, I think, the banking committee, to codify and strengthen existing sanctions from Obama's executive orders. There's also a standalone bill that Lindsey Graham, the Republican from South Carolina, introduced that would also essentially give Congress oversight over any attempt to lift sanctions. And he apparently wrote this bill months ago and then never introduced it, and now he's just sort of thrown it in because everybody else has. Even back then... There were some of, this is Lindsey Graham. I mean, yeah. even back then, they were looking at him and Russia with some concern. Here's the thing, guys. Just fucking man up and say it. You're clearly acting as if you're aware that he's involved somehow with Russia and that it will have an influence on what he does. Take the next fucking step. Well, and I just think it's it's fascinating from the perspective of Trump's supporters who are dwindling day by day and how the polls continue to get worse. They don't seem to understand that we were attacked by Russia. They literally tried to interfere in the democracy in a very sophisticated way. It wasn't just, you know, a few trolls online. I mean, yes, there were troll farms, and yes, that was a part of the, the operation, but it's much broader and more specific than that. They weren't messing around with this. This was an expensive thing, and Vladimir Putin himself ordered it. And yet... Donald Trump is completely nonchalant about the whole thing. He does not seem to think it's a big deal at all. How do you explain this? In your mind, Trump voter, how do you justify this? How do you justify our country being attacked by a foreign country and the current so-called commander-in-chief treating it as a total non-issue? I think part of it may be when you say something like the Russians attacked us, I think for a lot of his supporters, I don't think they recognize that realistically in modern warfare between nations... It's rarely guys on the ground with guns. It tends to be, 
intelligence agents, it tends to be cyber attacks, it tends to be all the things that don't look good on camera and don't make for exciting movies because you don't see shit happen. So for them, you saying that's an attack is just you being your yeah. snowflakey sort of democratic yeah, like just whiner. Liberal hysteria, a foreign a foreign despot spending you know millions perhaps more to influence a foreign election, and not just our election, but France, England, other countries in the you know the former Soviet bloc countries. It, it's all over Europe. But this is not the type of war that enables proud Americans to fillet soldiers, okay, yeah, and, yeah. and talk about how great our military is, because this is a war that doesn't involve the actual military, not in the way we understand it. It's sure. not guys with guns. It's not guys with grenades. It's not guys with bombs and all that shit. This is Cold War shit. This is the war that everybody basically thinks we won and that everybody slobbers all over Reagan's knob about, really what it amounted to was a bunch of people that you're never going to know, never going to see, and are never going to be praised in front of the television, did some sneaky shit, and we just did more effective sneaky shit than they did. Oh, that and we also basically invaded the shit out of them with Michael Jackson and blue jeans and fucking McDonald's. That was the other thing. That was a real war. It's just not one that gets everybody all hard. And the, the attack you're talking about is the same thing. It's not dramatic. It doesn't make for good TV. It doesn't get you parades and other fancy shit that gets everybody all excited around the 4th of July. But it was an attack. And it was probably even more insidious because it was an attack on our democratic process. One of the few things we have left to actually wave at the rest of the world and go, see, this is why we're still better than you. Because it sure isn't our fucking economy. It sure isn't the way our military is handled. It sure as fuck isn't our leadership right now. One of the few things we have left is the way that we select who's going to be in charge. And if you attack that, you're attacking the foundation of our country. And it's no different than if they rolled up with a fucking fleet full of guys with guns. And I suppose I should uh, offer another semi-correction of, of what I just said before. Donald Trump is actually, he's not acting like this is nothing. He's not really nonchalant. Uh, James Comey testified last week in open hearing. And what did Mr. Comey testify? Well, first thing, he called the sitting president a liar. The FBI director said that, well, here, I'll, I'll read to you from NPR. From his opening remarks, the fired FBI director made clear he believes President Trump was not truthful when he stated he fired Comey because the FBI was in disarray and poorly led. Quote, those were lies, plain and simple, Comey said, adding that Trump, quote, chose to defame me and more importantly, the FBI in those remarks. Comey also said that when Trump told him that he hoped he could let Michael Flynn go, that he took that basically as a directive to obstruct justice. Now, he didn't use those terms. He said he would leave it up to the special prosecutor, Robert Mueller, who we'll come to in a moment, to sort that part of the equation out. What we do know is that Comey very much believes that Trump is in some sort of an abusive relationship with his power. He's not acting normally. He is not acting like a president should in this situation. The thing that I actually kind of hear when you're talking about this goes back to the, the bit about Flynn and and hoping that that wasn't going to be a problem or however it was that you phrased that. That sounds literally like something out of a script for a mob movie. I need you to take care of a guy. We all know what that fucking means. It's the guy at the other place. You know, I uh, I hope he goes away. Yeah, maybe he'd be good. I don't know. Yeah, I hope, I hope this Flynn thing stops being a problem. I hope this Russia thing stops being a problem. How do you not interpret that as, hey, stay out of my shit? Well, Trump is a New Yorker. He's pretty much steeped in this kind of bullshit legal evasion talk. Hey, it's not like nobody's fooled by it if you've watched Goodfellas, but Trump was out there the next day on Twitter. Total vindication. Total vindication. The best thing you can say, and, and that's being generous, is that Comey didn't just nail him down directly. But there's absolutely, within Comey's testimony, enough for Mueller to legitimately go after a full-on investigation. I mean, how do you how do you hear that and and not think that this is suspicious enough it warrants looking into further? Well, and it just speaks to the idiocy of Trump because if all of your associates are in some sort of legal jeopardy, all of your associates. Michael Flynn is in the shit. He lied to the FBI. He's a, he's at least looking at a couple of felony counts, probably. Jared Kushner trying to open a back channel with Putin. He's under terrible suspicion. God only knows what the FBI is going to be doing with him. Jeff Sessions, perjury. 
Perjury on what? Lying about Russia. How you can feel vindication after Comey then also adding, oh, by the way, you yourself, sir, are a liar, and you tried to stop the investigation yourself. That's not vindication. That's the opposite of vindication. Even Eric Trump is now under some form of investigation because of his fucking charity. Not because of Eric himself. Uh, let me be clear about that. The issue is not Eric. He's been a huge supporter of St. Jude's, and I, I believe that's a legitimate thing for him. I don't think he's being an asshole about this. It's not a, it's not a scheme to make money. For our listeners, what Luane just did there, giving the guy credit, go listen to Rush Limbaugh and see if that ever happens. Sorry, just... No, 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 and that's fine. Regardless of my sort of perspective on, on Trump's sons, at least in this particular case, Eric Trump has been doing a very good thing for St. Jude's, and I, I can't not acknowledge that. Again, I'm not even saying he is the problem. Eric was running this charity event, and it's always hosted at Trump locations, which at the time was because, well, yeah, Dad's going to let me basically use this, so it reduces our expenses, which means more money goes to the charity. That's fucking fantastic. Somewhere along the line... Donald started charging. Not only did he start charging them, he started charging them what most experts would consider far in excess of, of what it would be. And now, as a result, because of this sort of shady shit, Eric's charity is now under investigation as well. This is the type of thing that sort of pisses me off because this is one of the few times you can find a Trump who's doing something legitimately good and Donald still fucks it. Yeah. Because and it's not, he, the, it's not the first time he ripped off a charity either. I mean, this story right. goes back to the campaign about that $10,000 portrait of himself he bought with charity money. We right. covered that before, too. But this goes back to what I said before. How much fucking money do you have to have before you act like a human being? Donald Trump's answer is typically more. So it's not even just the politics, and it's not even just Russia. It still goes back to business. Eric's now fucked because of this. And I'm waiting for some shady shit involving Ivanka to show up and for Don Jr. Because everything about the way they do this, if they learn how to run business from their father, I'm suspicious of it to begin with. But if he's involved, as was what happened with, with Eric's charity, then I'm even more suspicious that something criminal is happening. Well, all of the Trump kids are kind of in the same bed as their dad because the their company is not like a publicly traded company. It's not like a, a company with a reputation like Apple or Google or something like that. It's basically just a mom and pop operation with, as I think it was uh, Don Jr., right? Donald Jr. Donald is one Jr. of the sons. He said that, uh, you know, an unusual cross-section of their assets come from Russia. So, you know, you do the math on that. I don't even know what there is left to explain to people after that. But here's the thing. Even if we, even if we do, as we probably should, say things like allegedly or suspicion of, it doesn't change the fact that there is enough to warrant an investigation. To bring ourselves back to the topic at hand, if you guys need any more evidence that an investigation is needed and needed rapidly and probably should conclude as rapidly as possible, Sally Yates, fired. Preet Bharara, fired. James Comey, fired. And as of last night, headline in the New York Times, Friends says Trump is considering firing Mueller as special counsel. It's a good appointment. Uh, Bob Mueller is uh, universally respected. His reputation as a totally straight shooter is, is uh, widely recognized. And he is the kind of grown-up who in that job may not feel compelled, as some previous special prosecutors have, to find a crime whether one turns up at first or not. He's 72 years old. He's had a very distinguished career as a prosecutor, deputy attorney general, uh, and he, of course, was a U.S. attorney for a time, and, of course, had a, had a strong career as the FBI director himself. So he doesn't have a lot left to prove. Uh, it would be exceedingly wise, it seems to me, for the White House to embrace this, uh, to speak well of the appointment, uh, and, uh, and, and offer full cooperation. So the guy who's directly been hired to investigate him is looking at getting fired. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what happens. Let's see. If he's fired, then Trump may as well just say, yes, I absolutely am involved in Russia. Well, what's amazing to me is people haven't been able to figure out that he's already said it. That's what the firing of James Comey was. And then this is this is what really bothers me about the cable news media these days, is that there's almost like this pretense of naivete that they don't really have, but we, we have to keep asking, did the president really mean to obstruct justice? Of yes, course he did. Of course he fucking did. He said so on TV. That's what a dimwitty is. He's not even sneaky enough to get away with it. He admits to what he's doing in the moment. Because like Luane has told me off mic a million times, he's just the id. 
He lives in the eternal now. It's it's always the present. The past might as well not have happened. The future is not of concern. I have a problem. Hammer, fix problem. That is literally the depth of his so-called strategy here. Which is why his strategy is, I should probably get rid of Mueller. Except that if he goes the next step beyond that, that everybody else watching this has done, they're going to go, one, that makes you look guilty, and two, the Senate can just hire him back. The situation doesn't go away, you've just made it worse for yourself. But that's also how he appears to operate. And we're approaching like the end game of Watergate. This is where stuff started to get bad, right? I mean, Nixon asked his, uh, his attorney general to fire the special prosecutor, right. correct? He didn't. Another guy was brought in, was asked, I think I think there were two resignations, and then maybe the third little pig finally did fire the special prosecutor, but by then the Congress was ready to impeach. By that point, it's like, okay, could you maybe make it a little easier for us? Yeah. But again, Nixon also recognized, because he was forward-thinking enough, this shit's going to look bad for me. I should probably get out. And I don't think, I don't think Trump can think that far ahead. I don't think he can look at that. I don't think he understands consequences, I I think is what it amounts to. I don't think he realizes he doesn't know enough to know that everything he does makes him look worse. And it reminds me of an article I was reading this morning about uh, somebody who was writing uh, about Trump's earlier years as a kid and then, you know, growing up and his bankruptcy period and that kind of thing. He really doesn't have an ability to internalize failure. You know, human beings fail, all of us. You know, I've tried things, failed at things. If you haven't failed at anything, it means you haven't tried anything. It means you don't do anything. He does not have the ability to recognize when a situation is going completely sideways. I mean, he may know on some level, but it's like the, the logical connections that an ordinary healthy mind would make are not made in Trump's mind. It just becomes a, I need to strike out, I need to double down, I need to attack and be aggressive. But sometimes, like when you're dealing with the fucking FBI, that's not the smartest strategy. We've discussed before how they go about this. There are two ways. One of them is just shut the fuck up. Well, obviously he doesn't have the ability to do that. If you're a criminal, definitely shut the fuck up. Right. But the secondary issue is when you're being investigated, you basically go, yeah, sure, whatever you need. I mean, help you get anything you can get. Uh, is there anything else you need me to know or to do? What was it you said earlier? People who aren't guilty when they're being investigated ask questions. Yeah. The problem with him is he's not going to ask questions because he doesn't know, but it's because he's stupid, not because he's not involved. So just to, to pause there and to, to stick on this, because I think this is really important. If Trump is innocent of any collusion, any coordination with Russia, but his aides all seem to be in a pattern of lying and concealment about the issue. If you're innocent, wouldn't you be desperate to find out the truth of what happened so that you can get these people out? If you're not interested in finding out the answer, what does that say? It means you already know the answer. Right. Or you're too stupid, in which case, either way, you need to be right. out. If I'm hanging out with a bunch of people, and I have reason to believe that some of them might be doing something fucking treasonous, I might want to get that figured out. Especially if it doesn't actually involve me. You know, if I'm not guilty of whatever it is they're doing, but I have suspicion that they're doing something wrong, I should probably find out what's going on or take steps to make sure to insulate myself. But either way, there is an action that involves finding out what's going on. And Trump doesn't seem to have any interest in doing that. And, and beyond that, he has less than no interest. He does the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. If we recall that Michael Flynn, he was only let go. I mean, the, the, the administration knew what was going on with Flynn, with the calls to Russia about sanctions and, and possibly with the Turkey business. They knew about that beforehand because the Obama administration and several lawyers showed up at the door and told them. But it was only when the Washington Post finally made the story public that the administration moved on him. So this actually also goes back to the to the Nixon thing. The problem wasn't what they did, it was that they actually got found out. Which tells you that they would have been perfectly happy for things to continue the way things were going if they hadn't gotten caught. Which probably explains a lot of Trump's uh, animosity towards the media, because they keep revealing his shit. Yeah. Well, and then the thing that is baffling to me, I mean, I... I have trouble being surprised. We talk about this a lot, how surprise is kind of not an emotion that really is, is very much in vogue anymore <laughs> around these parts. But his supporters think that Deep Throat was the problem, not Nixon. His supporters think the leakers are the problem, that Comey leaked a private conversation, which wasn't illegal. He wasn't even in government anymore when he when he let that information go. 
It was a you know a conversation he had with the president. It wasn't a classified document. It was a personal memo. But they think that that is the problem, not the obstruction of justice. It's that Comey revealed obstruction of justice. Right. That is the issue. It's just, it's insane. This goes back to something I said, I think, in the, the previous broadside, that Trump supporters that are still maintaining their support of Trump have clearly put party, if not Trump himself, above the operation of their country. Well, yeah, it's not party. It's just Trump. They they don't even like they they don't like the typical Republicans. They hate Paul Ryan about as much as they hate Hillary Clinton. That's because a lot of these guys are the type of people that the actual Republican Party can't stand either because they're a bunch of hillbillies yeah, who are useful for numbers and nothing else. You could call it like the crusty vomit from the Southern strategy. I don't understand personally how you can how you could be that blind, that you could be that invested. And I know part of that is just a basic psychology, because I have the same issue when it comes to things like religion. Having come out of religion, I'm like, I don't get how you can still be that engaged in it when somebody points out to you that this is what's going on, and it's because you're invested. And so to some degree, I get that. But I don't get this. This, this reminds me to some degree of, of that image that I posted on Facebook, the you can't be a Nazi and a proud American at the same time. You cannot still continue supporting somebody like Trump and be a proud American. I just don't think you can. You are not thinking about your country because you should be at the head of this. You should be the ones going, I need to know, did you fuck us? Did you actually actively do something to harm the country I love? Why are you, as Trump supporters, not the ones the most vocal about this. I mean, that's that's a brilliant point. I mean, you would think that if, if you had supported somebody who then, you know, of course, many people who voted for him had no idea about the Russia stuff at all. I mean, there was information available going back to Paul Manafort in August and even in July. That still required some digging. Yeah, there, there were people out there talking about, but yeah, you, you would have had to, you would have had to go away from Fox News. You know, you would have had to actually right. leave the cradle to go and find this information. But why would you not be the most invested to find out the truth of this and demanding accountability? Uh, being a resident of Iowa, I am even more surprised that people are willing to throw away any shred of moral or ethical credibility they have for a man like Donald Trump. Typically in Iowa, we don't care much for braggarts, you know, for people who throw their money around, for people who throw their weight around and think they're a big shot because they're from fucking New York. You know, nobody gives a shit. Fuck you. They completely 180 on this. They refuse to even engage with the slightest criticism of him as a person, which is the easiest way to go after him, frankly. I mean, he, he looks orange and he has stupid hair and all that. But it doesn't make sense to me how people from this region of the world, having the so-called Midwestern values that we have, would fall for a shy like this guy. Recently, I went to, to do a job over a weekend, and it was out in rural Iowa, so several several counties away from the Des Moines area. It was probably more than an hour out of it. And the number of barns I passed that had fucking Trump billboards still on them, I'm like, I don't get it. You people are farmers. You people work your asses off. Exactly. You still you still try to make a living doing something that most people consider a waste of time. You're still doing all of the things your family's probably done for generations. And that's who you are. And this fucking New York douchebag rolls in throwing his money around, talking like an idiot. Who says around. you're an idiot? How stupid are the people of Iowa? And and this is the guy you're going to back no matter what? You guys are keg standing on Kool-Aid. I mean, it's like, I can't believe it. I can't believe what my eyes are telling me at times. How, how far you're willing to bend and genuflect to try and rationalize why this guy or anything he's doing makes any kind of fucking sense. And I know people are mad at Washington. And I know that they're mad, especially if you're in farming country. You're mad for a very good reason. Yeah, if but burning all that shit down, just burning it down without any other alternative, that doesn't work. And that's what you did. You set the whole fucking place on fire and then didn't give a shit about what your exit plan was. While I don't agree with it, I understand the the position that the, the Democrats and the Republicans are just two sides of the same fucking counterfeit coin. I, I get that. But I and I've and I've tried to but I've tried to stress this several times I've been in broadsides on these broadcasts. One of these parties is deliberately going out of their way 
to profit as much as they can at your expense. They are willing to let sick people die. They are willing to let poor people go hungry because they can't find a place that has nutritional food that will take their fucking food stamps. You cannot look at the way these two parties behave and still think that A, they're exactly the same, and B, that Trump was going to do a fucking thing to make your America great. If you need any further evidence of what Lewin just claimed, we actually have a Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. There is such a thing as the Progressive Caucus, and that you have a much more centrist and hawkish approach on things like Syria and whatnot from the, the right-wing moderates and the Democrats, and there is a real progressive single-payer toting left. In the right wing, what is the difference between Paul Ryan and some crank? They both have the same fucking health care bill. It's the same thing. Here's the other thing. The Sanders wing that you're talking about, that single-payer thing, that, that squishy liberal shit that everybody complains about, that squishy liberal shit is also meant to protect you, Trump supporter. It's not just for the Democrats. It's not just for the liberals. It is meant to protect Americans. All of them. Doesn't matter. Red, blue, green, whatever the other virtually non-existent parties' colors are. Everybody. And we can have all the debates we want about policy and about constitutionality and about the budget, etc. and so forth. But one party pushed a bill through Congress that would bring us back to the era of pre-existing conditions in healthcare, while the other party is pushing for single payer. There's an active effort right now to undo all of the regulations that were designed to prevent another financial disaster. Yeah, the, the House is trying to repeal Dodd-Frank. The Senate is trying to ram through secretly another health care bill that they won't let anyone see, which, of course, is because, uh, because it's not going to be anything anyone's going to want to vote for if they read the fucking thing. But yeah, sure, fine. They're, they're both two sides of the same fucking counterfeit coin. Whatever. For fuck's sake. I, yes, we keep going on about fucking Russia. Part of that is because it can't go away, okay? There's already a ton of shit since Trump's shown up that has gotten sidelined because another dumbass tweet comes out. We cannot let this go because it's fucking important. AJ wasn't kidding when he said the Russians attacked us. There was a period of time where you, Trump supporter... And your party, the Republicans, would have gone fucking apeshit. That the fucking Russians had done anything to attack us. And the reason this is important to me is because Donald Trump admires Vladimir Putin. He likes him. He thinks highly of him. He may not be a personal friend, but he thinks that what Putin does to maintain control in Russia is fucking awesome. And the problem that I have is, even though I'm not a student or a scholar of Russia, I do have a layman's understanding of exactly how Putin controls things in Russia. And let me tell you something. It is fucking scary. It is fucking vicious. You're not allowed to oppose Vladimir Putin in Russia. That's the kind of man Trump admires. Just yesterday, hundreds of people were arrested in protests. These were flash mobs. It was a, Alexei Navalny, the leader of the opposition in Russia, who has been brought up on false charges in front of a kangaroo court to prevent him from running, who has been arrested multiple times, including yesterday again, to prevent him from exercising any kind of democratic liberty. This is the kind of guy that attacked our country and that the current president, who was potentially installed by Putin, he loves the idea of this. He loves the idea of being able to be the big shot who points and people move. Protesters on the street, I move them off the street. It is so fundamentally anti-American, I don't know how anyone left in this country doesn't see it, but they don't. And here's the thing, and again, this is addressed primarily for Trump supporters. I get that you like this tough talk shit. I get that you like the let's step on the protesters thing when they're the protesters that are saying shit you don't like. I get that, because... You obviously didn't have a problem with protesters when they were like the Tea Party and stuff. But hypocrisy aside, here, here's the thing. You think it's great now because all the people that he says he wants to step on are people you don't like. But after he stepped on all of them, it's going to be your turn. And if you think that's incorrect, you don't think he would do that? Just remember, he's the guy that robs charities. So don't think he's going to give a shit about you. 
we know how dictators operate. If you have any sense of history, if you've been alive more than a decade or two, if you've ever seen anything on a news channel that doesn't involve Fox, you know how dictators operate. And it's just like this. And the people who support them are always the ones who think, well, it's not going to be me. But it is going to be you eventually, because there'll be nobody else left. Authoritarianism is both a you know, kind of government and an experience. It's also a mindset. It's a personality trait. It comes down to a certain psychological set of motivations and beliefs and reactions to criticism and things of the kind. Trump has all of the markers of an authoritarian, from the narcissism, the inability to handle criticism, the, the desire to shut down the media whenever possible, the, the desperate need to control what people believe and think about him, and the complete inability to ever be reflective and, and to see his own mistakes or apologize for anything. That is the one hand. Then when a person like that meets an opportunity, that's when shit gets scary. And whatever you think your relationship with Trump is, if you're going to his rallies, the only thing that he thinks is you're useful to him insofar as you feed his ego and his own desires. And the minute you stop doing that or he has no more use for you or you're cumbersome to him in some way, you're done. Can't get enough Swing State in your life? Follow us on Twitter at Swing State underscore show. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Swing State Show. Check out back episodes, our blog, and whatever other things don't fit on the podcast at swingstateshow.wordpress.com. That includes links to past episodes and individual broadsides on YouTube. If you want to send us love notes or hate mail, shoot it to swingstateshow at gmail.com. Thanks to all of you who listen, share, and comment. We really appreciate it. Now, back to the show. All right, hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, we wanted to hit one more thing real quick. We kind of alluded to it in the last segment, but right now the uh, Republican-controlled Senate is working on some sort of malignant health care bill that they won't let anybody see. Here's an article from Axios.com. Senate Republicans are working to finish their draft of the health care bill, but have no plans to publicly release it, according to two senior state GOP aides. Quote, we aren't stupid, said one of the aides. One issue is that Senate Republicans plan to keep talking about it after the draft is done. Quote, we are still in discussions about what will be in the final product, so it is premature to release any draft absent further member conversations and consensus. I'm also hearing on Twitter from a lot of reputable reporters from the Post and the Times, etc., that there's the potential that they will try and release this thing hours before they ram it through, that this will almost be like a kind of coup legislation, that they're not going to tell anybody anything, but at the last minute they'll drop it with no time for public comment, probably in the midst of some other shitstorm that Trump has created, and like the Dodd-Frank thing in the House, they'll try and knife you that way. So we need everybody to get to the phones and call their senators, Tell them that you're not interested in their fucking health care bill unless it's single payer. And then call your congressman and bitch at him about Dodd-Frank and their, uh, their vote to protect Wall Street over your interests. So until next time, organize, mobilize, protest, vote.